We have some guests with us this morning, so if you don't, didn't get a chance to say hi before the service, I'm sure you'll want to uh, look around you after we conclude today and, and meet some of the guests that are here with us today. We'll be beginning the service this morning with some old devotional songs that have to do with the idea of us living in Christ and Christ living in us. If you, uh, if you were in a youth group about 30 or 40 years ago, you might remember some of these. I want to know Christ and the power of his rising, share in his suffering and pour to his death. When I pour out my life to be filled with his spirit, joy follows suffering and life follows death. Welcome each and every one of you here this morning. We're just glad you're with us today. Uh, we have some friends with us that worship here about 20 years ago. So y'all new couples, y'all not going to know them. But Mike and Kathy Holt and the little grandson, glad to have them. And Miss Jack Hillvere, she's visiting. We're glad to have her. And George and uh, Candy Edmondson made a decision last Sunday to start worshiping with, worshiping with us. I see George isn't here, but Candy is. So. If you haven't met her, meet that girl. She'll talk to you. <laughs> and there, on the back table, there are some inserts you can add to your directory of the new families here. You know, anybody got anything else? We've got a lot of sick people around. We know that. So let's go to our Father in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and every day you give us, Father. We know every day is a blessing, Father. Just be with us. Continue to watch over us, Father, and our sick. Be with them, Father. Bring them back to the much-needed health, Father. Hopefully, in a short time, this pandemic will pass and things will kind of get back to normal if there's such a thing in this crazy world we live in, Father. Our world's in, our country's in trouble, Father. Uh, but we know you're in control, Father. So whatever happens, we know you're in control and you'll take care of things for us. You look out for us on a daily basis, Father, and we thank you for that. We thank you for each person here that worships with us. We thank you for each person that looks up to you as their God and Savior and their, your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for this time, and thank you for your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
with one of the men operating the stretcher, such weight and care. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting up the way out the door this morning. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here, finally. (laughs) Just in time. Just you, just in time. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Speaking of just in time, just the vine. uh, John writes in chapter fifteen. Jesus says, "I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away." And every branch that bear fruits that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, but must remain in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown away like a branch and dries up. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. song that's not in our hymnal, but uh, many of us uh, remember from other hymnals that we sang from before. We'll go right along with the passage just read. I am the vine, and ye are the branches, their precious fruit for Jesus today. Branches in him, no fruit ever bearing. Jesus has said, he I am the vine, and ye are the branches. I am the vine, be faithful and true. Ask what ye will, your prayer shall be granted. The Father loved me, so I have loved you. Now ye are clean through words I have spoken. Living in me, but truly shall bear. Dwelling in you, my promise unbroken. Glory in heaven with me shall share. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. I am the vine, be faithful and true. Ask what ye will, your prayer shall be granted. The Father loved me, so I have loved you. Yes, by new fruits the world is to know you. Walking in love and children of day, follow your kind before you lead to realms of glorious day. I am the vine and ye are the branches. I am the vine, be faithful and true. Ask what ye will, 
your prayer shall be granted. The Father loved me, so I have loved you. Christ above me, Christ beside me, Christ within me, ever guiding, Christ behind me, Christ before, Christ my love, my life, my Lord, bread of life from heaven, lover of my soul, peace of God's soul, ever present, I surrender my control to Christ above me, Christ beside me, Christ within me, ever guiding, Christ behind me, Christ before, Christ my love, my life, my Lord, mercy everlasting, tenderness divine, word of God so ever healing, I surrender heart and mind to Christ above me, Christ beside me, Christ within me, ever guiding, Christ behind me, Christ before, Christ my love, my life, my Lord, Christ my love, my life, my Lord. Only in thee, O Savior mine, dwell in my soul in peace divine. Peace of the world, though all the mind never can take from me. Pleasures of earth, so Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father and Almighty God, we take this time to remember our Lord and Savior. He came to this earth as man. 
sacrificed his life, gave us that opportunity for redemption, salvation, and an everlasting life, relationship with you, so precious a gift. We ask that you bless this, this loaf, his body, as we partake it. Bless each one of us, continue to draw us near, continue to provide us that comfort and, and hope. And we, all, we, we, we know all these things come from our Savior Jesus. We pray and hope all these things in his holy name. Amen. Amen. bow with me please father god again we come before you to thank you so much for the sacrifice that your son made on the cross we thank you that he uh, that you allowed him to come down to live amongst us to 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 uh to teach us lord but most especially to to shed his blood <coughs> that we might have salvation and restoration in you and all these things we praise you in the name of your son jesus amen amen Pray with me, please. Father, we come before thee again, thanking you for everything you do for us. Father, everything we have and enjoy in this life comes from you. Again, Father, we thank you for the greatest gift, uh, the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, uh, the sacrifice that he made for us. And now, Father, as we take this time to return a, a portion of the, uh, of the things that you have given to us, uh, may we do so in the same manner that you have given it to us cheerfully with love in our hearts uh, knowing that it will be used to tell others about your love and your saving grace. Yes. In 
Father, we thank you again for the blessings of this life and all you have done for us. In Christ's name we pray. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all. children's song, but I'm looking around and not seeing any of the little ones with us this morning, so we'll just skip right over that, and we'll go to the song that we have uh, before Ryan brings the lesson this morning, and if you'll be standing, we'll sing the song, Jesus is all the world to me. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day, without him I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go, no other one can cheer me so. He remains sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, my friend in trial sore. I go to him for blessings, and he gives them more and more. He sends the sunshine and the rain. He sends the harvest golden grain. Sunshine and rain, harvest rain, he's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, I want no better friend. I trust him now, I'll trust him when life's fleeting day shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend, beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, eternal joy, he's my friend. Would you please be seated?
Well, good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. We're so very thankful and grateful for each and every one of you here this morning. Of course, to our guests that are here this morning, we always want to be able to help give you a very warm welcome and always let you know by any time you are here to come and visit with us, we're always happy to have you here with us. This morning, we'll be uh, continuing along of the ideas that we've been uh, going through here, some of the challenging thoughts that are provoked inside of Scripture for us, thinking of all the different things that apply to the Christian life, and especially inside of the times in which we live in now, a lot of the uncertainties, some of the things that can be set before us, that we stumble, we fall, we try to look out for the hope and the things that are inside, but it's very hard to see where it can come from. In the last couple of weeks, we've learned exactly where it is we can get our hope from. The transforming of our mind, the renewing of it, allowing God to give us that fullness of our new life in Him. Having that identity put onto us of knowing that we are God's children. In fact, having ourselves knowing that as we have put on Christ in baptism, we truly have put ourselves on in Him. And so a lot of that ends up coming from, as we kind of ended up talking about a little bit last week, where some of the motivation comes through with that, where some of that is put into our lives. And one of the greatest things that we can always think about where we get motivation, where we get our strength, where we end up getting this confidence and the zeal, the faith that we have, has always been inside of Jesus Christ. And, you know, so I kind of ended up doing a little bit of the uh, reshaping of the song, you know, I heard it through the grapevine. Well, Christians, we are supplied by the great vine, looking through what Jesus Christ being the true vine for us when we are grafted into him, all those ideas and those thoughts of being transformed by him, putting him on, everything is established inside of this great allegory of the vine and the branches. So what does it that to start us out here this morning that the Lord desires for all of his disciples everywhere? Well, he desires the fullness of their being. He wants everything out of you. Heart, mind, soul, body, everything. As we talked about a little bit last week in Romans chapter 12, being that living sacrifice. Ken and I were actually talking a little bit afterwards. Uh, one of the Greek words um, that really I kind of wish I did put it in, but I don't like putting that much Greek into the sermons. But one of the words that was in there to talk about for sacrifice, laodote, ends up meaning a little bit to that, a little bit of that flashback to how the Levitical system of sacrifice was. How you would end up bringing an offering to God on the tabernacle that would be one that would be pleasing to him. And that idea of the fullness of the sacrifice of what he used there for that meant that not only did we bring the offering to God, but we were also the offering itself. God wants the fullness of us brought to him. And it doesn't matter, unfortunately, a little bit of the thing from the comparison from the old to the new. As you know, in the old, no spot or blemish could be put before the sacrifice. But for us, Jesus is what makes that sacrifice perfect for him. You don't have to be perfect to bring forth yourself to God as an offering. He does the perfecting for you. One of the great things that we can see out of that is that he not only desires the fullness of that being of us, but we are no longer to live for ourselves, but to Christ. Again, referring to what we talked about so much there, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Christ then gives this great teaching in John's gospel. Really, that just helps round out so much of this. And next week, we'll end up talking about, because we know of our identity, how God transforms us, and how Jesus still supplies us today, we'll talk about the walk that we have inside of the Spirit. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. And Christ gives this teaching in John's gospel. Jesus is the vine. 
each one of us, individual Christians that are branches off that vine, and God is the vine dresser. We kind of talked about that a little bit in our Bible class this past Wednesday whenever Paul ended up using a very similar metaphor in Romans chapter 11, talking about the olive tree and the branches that were on that as well. All of it springs forth from the holy root that is supplied from the source, from God, from Christ, and how we being supplied with the spiritual nutrition that he gives is able to go and bring forth out fruit. You know, growth is a very important part of our discipleship. One of the things that Paul ends up pointing out to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3 is the fact that they were still taking on just spiritual milk when they should have already graduated on to more spiritual, meatier subjects, how they were still seeming like they were still inside of the basics of it. Growth and maturity is always part of the Christian walk. And our fruit is is the product of that growth. As Luke chapter 6 ends up putting to it, if we are going to be disciples of our master, we will end up showing that by the way in which we act as our master. And by them, we glorify God. I want to here just real quick give you a few facts about grapevines here this morning and kind of end up seeing why this allegory of the vine and the branches is... Um, a, a very important one. Sometimes we end up reading it, but sometimes we don't end up getting the uh, background as to why it might have been used in the way that it was. You know, grapevines can grow on their own wildly. Uh, I mean, you could probably go to a lot of different places, especially in the regions in which Jesus would have been living at this time. Probably wouldn't venture too far out to say going along down the highway, you could end up having a wild grapevine just going here or there, a lot of different places. Uh, if you've never really gone and studied a little bit of the geography of the region of Galilee, Judea, and everything, I definitely would like to challenge you to do that because it's, it's beautiful to really see how much there is a very big, bountiful land there of flowing of milk and honey as God ended up promising Israel back in the day. But you know, whenever those wild grapevines are going about growing and producing fruit, they don't, they don't do very well whenever they're by themselves in the wild. A grapevine that's allowed to grow wildly will produce fruit, but it's poorer quality than one that isn't tended to. It has to be pruned regularly. Yearly is actually some of the things that is uh, actually recommended for those that tend grapevines. Grapes grow on one-year-old branches as well. And older branches will produce more shoots for grape-producing branches. The problem is, isn't that if the problem is if the vine isn't pruned, it will cycle through a year of just a whole bunch of leaves. And then the next year, too many grapes. To the point that those grapes will be of poor quality because there's not enough to go around from the vine itself. So it has to be pruned back in order to be able to help get the best out of what the vine can produce. Pruning helps keep that balance between just enough right amount of grapes to the right amount of shoots to be able to continue to perpetuate the cycle for the grapevine itself. Next year's crop won't become too heavy or too poor of quality. It will be just right. Goldilocks out there for you. It'll be just right. Simply put, grapes do best when they are rigorously pruned every year. The problem is, and that's one of the things that I take away whenever looking at the vine and branches, do we allow ourselves to be pruned every day by the vine dresser? As we talked about last week, do we allow that transforming to happen to renew our mind, or do we simply just ignore it? Are we a wild vine? Do we solely depend upon our true vine that sustains us and gives us all we need, or do we look elsewhere? I talked about a story of a, uh, another example uh, uh, I kind of like the book that I'm reading. It gives me a lot of nice little stories. Um, 
Dr. Neil uh, Anderson, in his book that I'm reading right now, tells of a story of a young lady, uh, one that was uh, grown up in the church, was getting ready to graduate high school, go on to a nice college, and um, ended up having a lot of great opportunities in her life, very blessed beyond measure. Her parents were very well off. A lot of great things were going on in her life. And as they're going on to a, um, probably going to be one of the last youth assemblies that they had. They had a camp every year that they always took all the youth to. Probably be one of the last ones she could attend to before she went off to college. And whenever she was designated as uh, one of the drivers there that day, he ended up getting to ride with her. Well, halfway down to the trip, she just started crying. I looked over to her and he said, well, Mary, what's... What's wrong with you? How, why, why, is every, why, why are you crying? Are you sad that you're not going to see me anymore? You know, trying to make a joke out of it. She said, no, it's not that. that everything just seems to be going wrong. I sat there and looked at her. The, the, she's a very good-looking young lady. Um, they're riding in a very nice car. Why, why was she... So sad. If it, if it wasn't going to be that she was going to her last youth experience, what was it? And he came to end up realizing, this is very early on in his ministry, the people that seemed to have it best put together on the outside usually don't have it best on the inside. A lot of terrible family problems were going on at home. Unfortunately, that mentality of keeping up with the Johnsons ended up rooting themselves inside the family. The nice cars, the nice things that they have and everything, unfortunately, weren't supplying the family with what they needed. They ended up getting to stop along the road and they talked and maybe came up with something a little bit different for her and that's where he ended up leading her back to, to the source, to Jesus, reminding of her of who she was inside of Christ and helping to remember that it's not the things that one possesses in this life, but what you have stored up after, leading yourself in the example of the Savior and allow him to give you that direction. Of course, some other counseling and some talking with the parents help make the situation a little bit better. But that's one of the reasons why when we end up looking at an example such as being tended by the grapevine of Christ, where is it that we know we are getting our source from? Where are we getting all of our nutrition from? Are we seeking it from other things, worldly things? Are we looking it for other? Because we might end up like the wild vine and end up producing much poorer quality fruit than one that is spiritually nurtured by the vine dresser. You know, bearing fruit is a product of being a disciple of Christ. As taught by Jesus, it is something that glorifies God because it's a mark of our discipleship in him. At the end of the allegory, it says there in verse 8, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. You know, that's one of the things that we end up looking about this and something that we end up looking at with the idea of being transformed, wearing the identity of Christ. It's not about what we do. It's about what we do for God. It's his vineyard. We are his vines. We produce fruit for him. All the different other kinds of metaphors, similes, uh, comparisons of what the kingdom is all go back to point that we are workers, tenders, laborers inside of his fields, inside of his vineyards. All of this is to give honor and glory to God. That purpose that we talked about with our first sermon in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the purpose God gave to us whenever we identify ourselves as Christ. He has given us that purpose as well, being part of it. So disciples have been appointed to bear fruit. As he ends up saying a little bit later on in the chapter in verse 16, you did not choose me, but I choose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. And that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Disciples are appointed to bear that. And unfortunately, what we end up seeing by this is if we are not, 
we are cut off by the pruner, God. In verses 1 and 2, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. From Christ, the true vine, and his father as the vine dresser. And fortunately, as branches that no longer bear fruit, they are cut off. In which case, there is designated for that. At the end of it, in verse 6, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. That is the end of it for one that is pruned out by God. Now, this does not make a situation hopeless, however. It's a warning, but it is something for us to remember our God is still patient with us as well. One of the other examples inside of Luke chapter 13 is another example of some agricultural metaphors from Christ. Inside of this section here, in a warning of do not trust of yourself, but totally lean upon God, he ends up giving this other parable of a barren fig tree. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Well, it almost seems to make sense as we've kind of gone through the vine and branches. Uh, It seems like that branch would be cut off. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? It's good for nothing. It's using up the soil, the nutrients, and all those other different kinds of things. But he answered and he said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. Let me resupply it. Let me give it some more nutrition. Let me reinvigorate inside of that branch. And if it bears fruit, well, great. Keep it. Leave it alone. Let it grow. We'll continue to tend it and allow it to continue to grow up. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. This isn't a hopeless situation that Christ is trying to put forth in John 15. God is still patient with us as a very caring and loving vine dresser. He's not going to sit there and look at the one vine as we kind of saw with the facts of the grapevines earlier. It goes through a cycle of producing every year. It's not going to come down three months down the line and say, well, this one's not doing anything at all, Clip. That's not what we're looking at here. He gives opportunity and gives ample patience, waiting for and supplies water, fertilizer, and all those different kinds of spiritual things we need in our life to be able to continue to grow in him. And that bearing fruit that we have is because we are in Christ, whether it is one that might be a dormant branch one that is alive and active and producing fruit now, no matter what, that is all because we are in the true vine of Jesus Christ. Again, this is something that is being taught by Jesus himself in verse 4. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Go and find you a stick out there on the parking lot and see if it's got anything on it. It can't do anything by itself. It has to be part of something else for it to produce and to make leaves, to make fruit. It has to be part of something. Abiding in him, we also bear much fruit. Now, you could end up getting into a little bit of a conversation of how much fruit do you produce and such. Well, that's actually up to the vine dresser himself. He knows how to prune you to make fruit. Whether it is that you can produce one big, awesome grape or maybe some nice little grapes. Whatever it is that God knows that you can produce, he will get it to where you can produce it. You've just got to let him do it. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. It's about the same thing as what Matthew chapter 7 ends up teaching us, or chapter 6, I should say, that we are ones who produce for God, and we are inspected by him. But how much of that? It's not about quantity. It's about quality. And that's what the Savior looks for. That's what God looks for. God 
has supplied all that we need when we are grafted into him. Our very source of living water and daily bread, which must be consumed by us. We have to have him fully into ourselves in order to do this. We have to abide in him. Something that is confessed very ardently by Paul. I can endure all things through Christ. I can do all things, endure all things. I can abide in whatever state that I am in verse 11. Whether a base or a bound, I know I am still supplied by Christ. Well, how is it that we abide in Christ? Well, we've talked about this a couple of times. Of course, first it starts with putting him on in baptism. But then by abiding in his love through keeping his commands. Verses 9 and 10 As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus very masterfully, I I, I want to use a different word than that, masterfully as the master teacher is able to help show that this relationship that we have with him as being the true vine is showing that that is also the same relationship that he has with the Father. He loves and obeys the Father, and that so too is also how we keep inside of our relationship with him as well. As he ends up saying later on in verse 17, these things I command you, that you love one another. And quite throughout the remainder of the gospel and then also into 1 John as well, a lot of those different concepts are also reiterated as well. Not to just be a doer or sayer, but also that you do it indeed as well. To be a disciple, we must bear fruit. Uh, there's nothing in here that says that the one who is by itself the one who decides that it won't produce any fruit will be able to do this. No, if we are in Christ, we will produce fruit. To bear fruit, we must abide in Christ. To abide in Christ, we must keep his commands. But what kind of fruit will disciples bear? Now, this might be a little bit of where some of the quality comes through inside of being part of the vine. Bearing fruit is manifested in many different ways, and these are really just suggestions. These are not all of them. These are maybe some of the more prevalent ones, but it's not all of them. Winning souls to Christ as expressed by Paul in his desire to go to Rome. He wanted to go there not only to visit with the church there, but so that he might also go and to be able to help preach the gospel. Disciples, creating more disciples, is a natural indication of bearing fruit. It's part of the Great Commission. We go out and teach and preach, and those that believe are baptized, and the cycle just continues to go on. It perpetuates itself. There is always, as John chapter 4 ends up pointing out to us, a whitened harvest ready to be able to come bring in. A wise soul is a tree of life to others, as the proverb ends up saying to us. And that is something that Christ wants inside of our life as well. The wise tree. Sharing with those in need as well. Paul ended up saying that and is describing in the distribution to the gift to the saints. In Romans chapter 15. Something that was also seen that was an evidence of God's grace at work in the givers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8. How those of the region of Macedonia were able to give out of their poor, their downtrodden life, but was still able to help deliver a gift to the saints. Developing a Christ-like character. This is an indicator that one is walking in the Spirit, and that's something, again, that we'll end up talking about next week. Evidence that is diligent in growing in the true knowledge of Christ, something that we talked about in our study last year in 2 Peter chapter 1, that great symphony of all those great graces that Christ has given to the believer that harmonize with one another, that if you try to grow one without the other, it ends up making a discord out of it. But when all of them are done completely, there's a beautiful harmony, a song to give out to the world. Being filled with fruits of righteousness, as Paul again ends up saying in Philippians chapter 1. 
Praising God and giving thanks is another way that bearing fruit is manifested as well. The fruit of our lips and praise and prayer are spiritual sacrifices, as Hebrew 13, 15 says. And then it's something to be offered continually before the Lord. Again, it kind of ends up coming full circle with that idea of bringing ourselves as both offering and offerer to God as the living sacrifice of Romans chapter 12. And as we bear fruit in these different ways, and of course, more so, we not only glorify and prove to be fruitful disciples, but we also experience the abundant life of which Jesus spoke about, of being our true shepherd. I'm going to go over to John chapter 10. I just have verse 10 quoted here, but I want to start up in verse 7. And just looking at this passage here, how much of an impact it gives to us. Another one of those I am's here that's uh, evident inside of John. Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Again, that idea of where we talked about in 2 Corinthians 5. Whenever he purposed to give us the identity of Christ, it also purposed to give us a purpose. That's how we end up experiencing this full and abundant life now as well as in eternity because he has given us something to accomplish as our master. But he continues on, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep just as the vine ends up giving everything to the branches to produce fruit. So also too, Jesus as being the good shepherd gave everything so his sheep may be well provided. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, he who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Well, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Another sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down for myself. I have power to take it down, and I have power, I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Just as Jesus himself could not do anything without the Father, so we also too cannot do anything without our good shepherd, without being part of the true vine. Nothing that we do here on this earth cannot be accomplished without being part. If not, being the wild vine may produce poor, inferior quality, less better producing of a crop, more sporadic just leaves rather than just bearing fruit. Being fruitful leads to the fulfilled life. Looking at the examples of what can be produced as fruit, see how these examples can give you that sense of completeness, that purpose that has been given to us by the true vine. Well, winning souls produces joy. As Christ reveals at the end of the three parables of the lost things in Luke 15, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, the prodigal son, there was always rejoicing. And with the first two, angels in heaven rejoicing over the one sinner who comes back in repentance and the ones that are still remain. How true it is that winning a soul for the Lord produces great joy both here on earth and in heaven. As Paul found that case to be with the Thessalonians, I love this example in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 and following. For you remember, brethren, our labor and our toil, for laboring night and day, that we not, not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses in God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. 
as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Man, how beautiful it was to see that just because they went in and to work diligently and hardly with them, that someone as being in the town of Thessalonica in that time could end up producing a faith that is as abundant as it was able to go out throughout all the regions. John realized this with his children as well. One reason many Christians may not enjoy the fullness of joy in life is maybe that they've never bore any fruit in leading others to Christ. Sharing with others also produces happiness. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 35, what Paul ends up telling to the Ephesian elders there in that passage, he ends up telling them, is more blessed than it is to receive. It's much more blessed to give than to receive. Well, the word there that's used for blessed can also be translated as happy. You can be much more happier giving than it is to receive. It also, as Paul ends up pointing out to the young preacher Timothy, it avoids the root of all evil. And the two roots can be in the good root or the root of all evil of the love of money in 1 Timothy chapter 6. If Christians are very materialistic and selfish that they do not share, they will never know the joy, the happiness, the blessedness of giving. <laughs> Developing a Christ-like character also produces assurance. At the end of 2 Peter chapter 1, we are also illustrated that not only one who ends up abounding in all those different graces inside of the Lord may end up to where they will never stumble again, but it leads to an abundant, joyful, triumphant entry into the kingdom. It secures that abundant interest, entrance. Developing a Christ-like love gives assurance of one's discipleship and salvations. Again, what Paul, uh, what John had ended up pointing out in John chapter 13, although it's not a new commandment, Jesus ended up saying this, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It's new because of the freshness that is beyond it. We all know that we're supposed to love and to take care for one another, but a newer one, to go into that agape love, that sacrificial giving of ourselves to help our brethren as well. It's pointed out with another metaphor, nothing can be done without being supplied from the head of the church, Christ himself. It was also pointed out in Jeremiah and Isaiah, we are but just the clay and he being the potter. Many Christians sometimes feel that they have no assurance of eternal life. And no wonder if a renewing of the spirit and the mind by the Father is resisted. Who are we but just branches in his vine? Who are we but just the clay that he shapes and molds? To the one that resists that, it either gets tossed away into the part shards that's used inside of that, or being pruned out by the vine. Praising God and giving thanks also produces peace. Of course, something that we looked about in Philippians chapter 4, prayer is the antidote for anxiety. And let all your supplications, let it be known to God that your worries are taken away from Him. To know that He is joyfully and willingly always ready to supply the need because it produces a peace that surpasses all understanding. And for, in response to prayer, God, uh, God will guard our, high, our hearts through that peace. Failing to bear much fruit regarding prayer, Christians will be filled with anxious lives, not abundant living. So here inside of the conclusion of our sermon here this morning of being supplied by the grapevine, what is it that we can see that we have learned? Why is it there a need to be supplied by the grapevine? Well, it's necessary to be a faithful disciple of Jesus. It is necessary to have a fulfilled life as being a disciple of Jesus. It is necessary to continue 
to be in Jesus. If you desire to be both faithful and have a fulfilled life as a disciple of Jesus, abide in him and produce fruit that glorifies the Father. Again in verse 8, by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. If you are not yet a disciple of Jesus, then let his own words lead you to become one here today. It's part of the invitation, whether it be that you need that need or that you are part of the vine. Maybe you just need a little extra help in allowing the Lord to prune you. Or if you have another request, maybe you've got a little old worm that's gnawing at your fruit right now. You just need a little help with that. If there's anything that this congregation can be able to help assist and help provide for you here this morning, we'd love to be able to do so as we stand and sing our song of encouragement. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restored. My heart is weary, please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my life, rebuild my faith, go restore my soul. Revive the fire, Lord, deep in my soul. Stir my desire to work in your fold. Light in my heart, dear Lord, your zeal grown cold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Renew my courage, Lord. It needs restored. My cup is empty. Refill it, dear Lord. Replace all doubts and fear with faith so bold. Renew my life, rebuild my faith. Oh, restore my soul. Renew my love, rebuild my faith. Oh, restore my soul, renew my love, rebuild my faith. Oh, restore my soul. Appreciate that lesson, Brother Ryan. If you'll just remain standing for a minute longer, we'll have our closing song and then be dismissed with a prayer. I'd like to encourage uh, all you singers and people that enjoy to sing out there. Our chorus, our uh, Grace Notes group has started resuming uh, uh, practicing together on Sunday afternoons at 5 o'clock. So I know it's cold out there. Maybe by 5 it won't be quite so cold. So we'd love to have you come join us uh, for that today. Um, we uh, got the information through the, uh, the emails about our sister Vicki Minson, and you'll want to be sure to check that email and keep her in your prayers as she's going through a, a, a difficult struggle right now with, uh, with her lungs. And is there any other uh, <coughs> news that needs to be made known before we're dismissed this morning? We'll be closing with the song, Jesus, Most of Sharon. We'll sing uh, verses 1, 2, and 4, and then a closing prayer. Jesus, rose of Sharon, bloom within my heart. Beauties of thy truth and holiness in part. That where'er I go, my life may share a broad fragrance of the knowledge of the love.
Father in heaven, we come to you this day thanking you for this first day of the week, the opportunity to be here and worship with one another, worship you in truth and in spirit. We ask you this morning to bless our congregation here. Please bless the elders as they lead us. Please bless the deacons as they serve. Bless each member. Please draw us closer to each other and closer to you. Amen. We ask you to bless Ryan as he imparts your word. Give him a ready recollection. And help him to always be effective. We ask that you bless our hearts to be evangelistic and bear fruit for you. Please yes. help us to recognize that your church is crucial. Your true church is crucial in our community and in our nation. Yes. We ask you now to be with those among us who are ill. We ask you to bless their loved ones and their caregivers and strengthen them. We now ask you to go with us as we begin a new week. Help us to always be good examples for you. We ask in Christ's name, amen. 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 <coughs> Thank you.